All Welcome right. to Bistec's Health and Wellness Show, where we focus on equipping you with the knowledge on health and wellness to help to ensure that you are more productive and healthier for yourself, for your families, and for your employees. Today, the conversation is about looking after your heart and how there are tools out there to help you to monitor your heart health from your home. Now, to bring expert insights, we have Dr. Gary Lee, the consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Thompson Hospital in Kota Damansara, and Elvin Lee, CEO of BioD Medica. Now, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Have a good evening, all. Yeah. Gary, I'm going to start with you. Sure, um, Ryan. Could yeah. you just explain your area of specialty and share a little bit about your background? Okay, sure. Thanks, Brian, uh, for the kind invite as well today. I'm very glad to be speaking to our dear audience as well. So basically, people used to ask me, you know, you are a cardiologist, but what is electrophysiologist? So yes. I always tell them I wear two caps. One cap is I'm a plumber. So I do all coronary intervention. Things people talking about, angiograms, angioplasties. If you have blocked vessels, we open it up. Those are the plumbing work. I okay. tell them, apart from that, I do also an electrician work. You know, so I'm really wearing a two cap. So if you have abnormal heart rhythm, uh, palpitations, where you have uh, electrical problems within the heart chambers, that's the time you call for a cardiac electrophysiologist to come in and dwell with it. And then that's very relevant to the topic that we are talking today about atrial fibrillation, which is exactly, in true sense, an abnormal heart rhythm condition itself. Yeah. Okay, Gary, I'm going to come back to you about the atrial sure. fibrillation. But... I want you to give us some insights from a macro level. Mm. How are Malaysians currently uh, impacted by heart health? Yeah. Uh, uh, because we have generally uh, rather poor diets. Correct. Uh, rather than saying being a poor diet, I would say we are rich with good diets, <laughs> which is of course then contributes to a lot of... Uh, uh, what we call atherosclerotic heart disease and things like that. So a lot of times, you know, we do see that from the uh, National Health Mobility Survey that has been carried out from years uh, onwards already. We do realize that the heart problems tends to predominate the statistics that's being churned out every year itself. And it actually boils down to the fact that we have a lot of risk factors that carries and predispose one to actually this kind of heart problems itself. So the problem is, no, that's only uh, underlines the fact that we do not pick it up early. We tend to ignore the symptoms which comes about. And then when the time symptoms becomes a bit more apparent, that becomes a bit tad too late for us to do something about it. So we do see just not only the incidence, but the prevalence of the heart disease actually becomes a bit more common nowadays. And most of these heart disease we are dealing, talking about is actually vessels blockage, heart failures, abnormal heart rhythms, and so forth, you see. Now, how are these risk factors uh, identified? Well, most of these risk factors are identified if ones are more vigilant on looking at their health conditions. For instance, those who do go for health screenings, do for medical, routine medical checkups, they probably pick it up much early at an earlier stage where you probably can do something more before it sort of becomes a bit more progressive in nature. And having said that, you know, most people at the early stage of their conditions, or for instance, hypertension or diabetes, you probably will not have any symptoms. So it is really boils down to being vigilant on looking at your own health and trying to go for routine medical checkup. That is when you really pick up all these problems and treat it well before, you know, it sort of propagates into a small, severe form of uh, disease. And Gary, when should we, from an age perspective, hmm. Uh, uh, a time where we start to be more aware about getting regular checks on our heart. Check Brian, if you were to ask me this question 20 years ago, I'd probably tell you, don't bother about checking your heart when you're, until when you are 50 or 60 years of age. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, we are seeing uh, younger patients coming to us with heart attack, heart problems. Therefore, you know, it's never too early, I would say, you know, to go for a routine medical checkup. Especially if you do have risk factors, if you tend to be overweight, you have family histories, you have some unhealthy lifestyles or dietary intakes, you know, these are the time you should be a bit more vigilant and do it much earlier. And just to share with you, my youngest heart patient is actually at the age of 20. So it is not wow. something too far-fetched for you to do it earlier. Yes. So Gary, yes. Gary, I have a personal experience <laughs> as well. One of my cousins just went for a bypass, 33 mm -hmm. years old. Yes, that's right. You are seeing much earlier onset 
in, ter in terms of all these heart disease actually. So it's something, it's scary, but this is a fact of life which we need to face nowadays in the era of modernization. Okay, let's zoom into arterial fibrillation and why is that yeah. awareness, uh, why is the awareness level rather low compared mm. to heart attacks, for example? Correct. Because heart attacks seems to be more pressing when the symptoms come. You get chest pain, and uh, people get worried when you have chest pain. And of course, over the years, uh, the uh, campaigns has been uh, managed to actually raise awareness on heart attack. But uh, if you do realize that actually atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal heart rhythm, where your heart beats in a very chaotic manner, can equally contribute to damage of the heart itself. But often than not, the symptoms of atrial fibrillation at the very early part of the disease tends to be palpitations. And a lot of times, because of our work, our lifestyles, you know, we have been very busy with, and with our lives and so on. Most of the time, we tend to blame it on being unable to get good enough rest. We've been taking a bit more caffeine at that point of time to keep us aware and alert to do our job and things like that. So we tend to minimize the impact or the severity of symptoms of palpitations. But the first onset of palpitation should really alert us that you know, we would probably have this, this so-called atrial fibrillation or abnormal heart rhythm that may actually propagate on and progress on if we sort of do not uh, make a good diagnosis of it and at the same time manage it well right up front. Okay, now I'm going to move to you, Elwin, and please tell us what Biody Medica does and tell us a little bit about your heart monitoring products. All right. Hi, Brian. Thanks for the introduction and I think uh, thank you for the opportunity as well. Okay, for BioD Medica, we actually uh, uh, import and distribute this particular device called uh, Cardia. It looks like this. Okay. And this, uh, with this device, actually, uh, you, know, we, you just need to place your finger and with the app installed in your phone, you can actually record your, your ECG, uh, electrocardiogram. And uh, this, this tracing or this... Uh, of this ECG, it's important I think to, to detect you know, some the electrical aspects as how Dr. Gary had mentioned, uh, the activity in your heart. So this is the device that we are uh, currently distributing in Malaysia and it's called Cardia. Okay, can I ask you, why, uh, why would I use uh, your product Cardia versus for example, using some very off the shelf uh, uh, fitness type apps that are linked to watches, for example, uh, wearables, which yeah. should, in theory, give me the same sort of results. Okay, maybe yeah, it, it's it's true. I mean that that uh, I mean there is uh, watches as well as other devices that's available in the market, but uh, for in terms of uh, uh, clinical evidence wise, you know, uh, this particular device, uh, Cardia. There is a lot of extensive research being done. I think uh, they, they do have like more than 80 uh, peer-reviewed uh, articles being, being uh, or, or should I say, uh, this device has been investigated. And uh, in terms of the algorithm, you know, that is where the key of, of where a life core uh, lies. The algorithm is able to, uh, to accurately uh, process the signal that was recorded uh, in terms of the sensitivity or specificity, in terms of accuracy wise, is almost uh, ninety eight percent compared to uh, to twelve lead ECG. So in terms of the accuracy wise, yeah. So and and one of the things that so I did some research on this, and so the difference primarily is, and so what you're saying is, yours is a medical grade signal as opposed to a consumer grade signal that comes from a wearable. Yes, uh, I think in terms of the uh, how how the uh, the device itself uh, processes and how the reporting wise of the of the uh, signal or the tracing of the ECG, maybe uh, Dr. Gary, you want to comment on this? Yeah, you know, for your experience. Thanks. I actually wanted to uh, add on to what uh, Elwin was mentioning as well. You know, the, we we do have a lot of wearable heart recorder device in the market. You know. And it's now being widely accessible to a lot of people thanks to online shopping. <laughs> Probably yes. that's one of the blessing of uh, MCOs that we have seen the uh, uh, search in the online shopping itself. But we do need to understand that there are also limits to all these wearable devices because there are some uh, signals 
quality as an issue. The reliability of the recording is also another issue. And most of these wearable fitness devices allows you to monitor the heart rate, which is very good. It's, but unfortunately, it's not a thorough aspect of how you monitor a person's heart rhythm. To look at whether someone's heart rhythm is normal or not normal, we basically look at two aspects. One will be in terms of the heart rate. The second is we want to look at the electrical recording of the heart, which of course, uh, wearable devices like Cardia Mobile allows you to look at that. And once you're able to look at the um, recordings itself, the tracings of the electrical rhythms of the heart, your physicians or your doctors you know, will be able to detect whether this is an abnormal heart rhythm or not. But looking at heart rate itself without looking at the electrical tracing, you will not be able to make a good medical judgment as per se, what is this symptoms related to? Is it really an abnormal heart rhythm occurring for the patients? So this is something that you know differs a lot when you're looking at using Cardia Mobile to record an abnormal heart rhythm, which doesn't only give you rate, but also the electrical tracing. It is as though, I always tell my patient, you have an ECG machine by your side all the time. You know, with that ECG machine, you can always run through and get a recording and then you probably bring it to your doctors during the visits to the clinics. Then you will show them, look here, this is a time when I have abnormal symptoms and this is my recording. And what would you uh, decide of this? So that really sets it a bit, a bit apart from the uh, most commonly available form of wearable devices. Okay, now uh, just a disclaimer to, to our audience. Yep. Dr. Jerry is not employed uh, or does he receive any financial incentive for recommending this product? Now, you, uh, Gary, you recommend this to your patients. Generally, what age group are, do they fall? Yeah. Uh, uh, what sort of range do they fall under? Well, in that sense, most of them, I, I will recommend it to my patients who actually comes to me with palpitation, irrespective of the age group. Because often than not, um, as an electrophysiologist, we do realize that capturing an abnormal heart rhythm sometimes Lux does play a bit of part role as well. So, because often they're not, when you start having palpitation, when you arrive at the emergency rooms or when you arrive in the, uh, your friendly neighborhood clinics, you probably by then you will not have any more palpitation. And an ECG recording at that point of time will just only show a normal heart rhythm. Right. But you will probably miss the boat of diagnosing a real abnormal heart rhythm. So, therefore, if my patients at the preliminary investigations and assessment, I find that I do not have a good answer for them that why are they having palpitations? Is it really an abnormal heart rhythm? This is a time I would suggest to them having a wearable devices or having a recorder which they can keep by themselves. And at any point of time when they start having symptoms, they make a recording and they can always even you know email me or send the uh, recordings themselves to me. Oh, come over to my clinics or uh, to my center itself for me to have a look at the recordings that they have made at that point of time. So especially for patients who have symptoms of palpitation, which is transient, very short-lived, this will be really a good device to be uh, to, to own and actually to have it for them. Now, Alvin, I want to ask you, can you kind of uh, walk us through how people would actually use these devices? And you have two versions of this device, correct? Uh, of Cardia Mobile. Yeah. We do have uh, two devices. Okay, one actually is a single lead and uh, the other one is a six lead. So the one I have here is actually a six lead and they actually have a uh, electrode behind mm -hmm. while the, while the uh, single lead is just uh, two panel electrodes. There's no electrode behind and, 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 and for six lead, I think the difference here is that you know, it provides more visibility in terms of, to doctors in terms of the uh, leading uh, indicators because it is able to capture more information. While the Does other... it capture the information on an app? Yes. So I think the first thing to do is actually once you, let's say for example, you know, a, a patient that has this device, the first thing they need to do is actually to, invo uh, to install the app in their phone, create uh, an account. And from there, I think uh, once uh, the app is installed on the phone, either Android or Apple, iOS, uh, with that app itself, they can connect to this device. So, so this device that you connect via Bluetooth, uh, while the previous uh, generation, uh, one actually uses ultrasonic. But in most cases, uh, this device in terms of uh, versatility wise, in terms of the signal wise, this is a lot better. Yeah. So do we wear it around our chest or how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one actually. 
Okay, for this device, um, you can just keep it next to you or whether in your pocket in, or in a case. Okay. Uh, so when, when a patient has palpitation, for instance, so uh, uh, he or she can actually bring this up and, and just place their finger on the electrode for, for 30 seconds. So okay. this, yeah, and then you'll be able to uh, uh, record the ECG tracing into the app in the phone. Okay. So it's a lot convenient. Yeah, I mean, looking at this device, I mean, previously in the past, uh, you know, we do have 12 lead ECG, you know, but to just record an ECG, I think that was really, incom uh, really inconvenient. You no know, one you need to do, take off your, uh, your shirt and then- Correct, that's why I asked you about and that. Like that you know? <laughs> and, and sometimes, you know, if, if the leads are not properly placed, so you, know, you might not get a good reading as well. So with this, I think this pretty much simply, you know, under, the, under 30 seconds, <laughs> you get a reading. So you can do it as often as possible. Yeah. I think the yeah, heart rhythm, you, yeah, so. so Gary, for you, yeah. then it obviously helps a lot because you can literally get a, a historical record and, yeah. and, and catch all the irregularities. So whenever, say for example, I have heart irregularities, but, and, and, and I, your heart responds differently, right? So perhaps over a one week period, you take it over a couple, anytime I feel any sort of irregularities, and then I send the, the collected data to you, you yeah. then analyze and then you can make a much more informed decision. Yeah, I mean, certainly it really helps physicians, not only an electrophysiologist to make a diagnosis of abnormal heart rhythm, which sometimes appears in proxism periodically, you know, it's not there all the time. So it definitely helps a lot. It's really revolutionized how we detect abnormal heart rhythm over the years. You know, back then, we do have something called a rhythm card. Really, it's just like our business card itself. Yeah. Whenever patients start having palpitation, they're probably going to place it on their chest, but there are limits to it. You know, uh, For instance, this, some rhythm cards allows you to have 10 recordings at most. You probably loan it to a patient for 10, for two weeks or so like that. Then probably they need to return it to you after that. So you know, having a, a, a user-friendly wearable devices that records heart rhythm as an event recorder I think that will be useful certainly uh, in some cohort of our patients as well. Now, uh, either for either of you can answer this. What are some of the innovations of late that have been made it a lot easier to monitor our health from home? Mm. All right, that's very interesting as well when you're asking that monitoring heart from. Actually, I do come across uh, people coming to me with certain devices that even allows you to monitor your blood pressure. Then it will send the blue to a Bluetooth um, connection. It will send the, uh, the data to the apps itself, and with the apps itself, you actually sort of uh, sum it up over the uh, weeks or months and send it over to your physicians. Some of them even have gadgets that can allow you to monitor your oxygen levels. We call it the SpO2, the oxygen saturation as well, and that also can be compiled within the apps and actually send it over to your physician as well. So we do see this coming more and more where people when they are more aware and more vigilant on monitoring their, not only about heart rhythm conditions, but also their body functions, the blood pressures and things like that, make it accessible through an apps and digital, or I would say it's, it's an era of digitalization in terms of health monitoring now. So we, we do have that. And that I think really started all from the time where in the olden days, when we have implanted the pacemaker for people with yes. slow heart rhythm, uh, back then, they usually they need to come to the clinics for us to examine, for us to check, making sure the pacemakers is functioning well, the batteries is still long lasting and things like that. But then we begin to have more revolution in terms of patients who are staying a bit remote areas. We can actually give them a home monitoring device that communicates daily with the pacemaker and which allows the doctor remotely to monitor the patients who are on pacemaker as well. So that was on patient with devices. But nowadays, I think taking on from there, now we start having devices that allow patients who have no heart problems at the beginning or do, or do or those who have heart problem but yet is not discovered or diagnosed yet to allow them to do monitoring from home itself. Sometimes. In fact, one of the things with this pandemic is the fact that people have now started to realize that telemedicine is ready for prime time because of all the yeah. equipment like this, very simple devices like this, that, that basically people in remote areas can still get medical advice from a doctor like you in an urban center because they, they can have these portable devices and then send the, basically the readings across to you. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's very true because, in fact, uh, over the one year plus when we are facing with this pandemic, uh, my center has been actually engaging into teleconsultation as well. Okay. So we do we do start doing that, and I find that it sometimes it's useful, especially for patients who are on follow ups. They would like to look at their monitoring of the heart rhythm and things like that. You know, they they, they do go through that sort of platform as well. Yeah. Now, yeah. any uh, sorry, Gary, uh, uh, sorry, Alvin, any uh, thing you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think one of the experience that we, I mean, uh, I mean for myself as well, as well. I mean, during the uh, the first MCO, you know, there's limited mobility, mobility and and and. You no, know, having you know, I, I do have this at home. So at that point, you know, there's palpitation. You no, know, of course, you know, is you can't go out, and then yes. uh, of course, having to you know being uh, healthcare and get to know a lot of cardiologists as well. So I actually did this and sent it to 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 uh, uh, a cardiologist friend of mine to see hey, is this okay or not. No, but in most cases, I think it, I mean this device actually can tell you, you know whether it's normal or not. It is when you know you do encounter like you no. Know, something abnormal like certain signals, then you might want to, uh, it's a very convenient device and see peace of mind. You can just uh, download the uh, easy tracing and then just WhatsApp it over uh, or even to email it over to your uh, your cardiologist and they can have a look at it and, and they can just verify is this really normal or not. So so this is something that is, is really convenient and this uh, one experience that we had uh, during uh, the first MCO was, yeah. Yeah. Taking on from what Alvin mentioned just now, so the very important thing is, you know, when you have recording, uh, uh, event recorder where at hand, you manage to get uh, some recordings and tracing of your heart rhythm. Uh, it's always good to verify with your physicians or your doctors uh, on the uh, findings and things like that. So it makes people a bit more aware of their heart rhythm problems and sort of verify whether the palpitations are something sinister or not. So I, I think it's useful at the, for a lot of patients, uh, whether they have symptoms or no symptoms, or just fairly, they just want to realize, to know whether their heart rhythms are normal or not. Now, Gary, final question for you. Yeah, sure. um, what tips could you give our audience in terms of generally looking after their heart health? Hmm. Well, that's very... Uh, interesting questions. <laughs> I do get asked a lot wherever I go about this. But basically, uh, from a doctor's point of view, I always say that, you know, um, a good, healthy lifestyle is very important. All right. Um, balanced diet is also equally important. But at the same time, picking up on subtle symptoms that's occurring on your body itself is also equally important because when you act on these subtle symptoms, you get it, check it out. And then, um, you know, in terms of uh, symptoms that appears periodically and you get to check it out, you'll probably be able to pick up problems much earlier and render appropriate treatments at an earlier stage, therefore minimizing the damage in the long term itself. But I think that's very important to take home. Do not minimize um, the symptoms that you may have actually at a point of time. Now, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Okay, sure. Thanks, Brian. Thank Thanks for Thanks, Brian. hosting Thanks us for today. Yeah. Okay. And Thanks. stay safe and stay healthy too, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm Brian Fernandez, and we've been speaking to Dr. Gary Lee, consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Thompson Hospital in Kota Damansara, as well as Elvin Lee, CEO of BioDmedica, on Vistag's health and wellness show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, as well as our website, www.vistag.asia please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.